All right. Well, um, I think, yeah, shoot, probably before the, right before the pandemic, um, I talked about some chronic knee injury uh, or knee pain at that time. Uh, it's my acute knee injury lecture. I try to give these like at least a couple times while you're here. So certainly some of you here may have heard this at some point be before. Uh, Review is always great because uh, uh, especially if you're not doing these things all the time, um, it is helpful. Uh, for those that are, yeah, um, the virtual, it's a little tougher. I mean, I typically try to get somebody up here and just kind of do the exam. We'll try and just go off the pictures here uh, and go through some of the examination of the knee. Because um, there are some special tests that, you know, I think most people come over are pretty, have a pretty good grasp on the knee exam. It's always the shoulder one that's the tougher one for people. Um, but we'll go over the knee exam, uh, kind of key things with history, and then uh, kind of some just management things uh, with, with regard to just specific knee, you know, acute knee injuries. I'm not going to be touching on fractures and other things. I'm mainly looking at kind of the more common kind of non-fracture injuries that you're going to encounter. So especially if you're covering athletics, kind of the twisting, cutting injury is the most common thing. Honestly, for people out in the community, it's the same deal. They slip, fall, their ego is one, you know, embarrassed or valgus, they twist it, feel something happen, and then they show up uh, in your office. So kind of the top things um, that I list in this for, especially, you know, athletics, uh, twisting and cutting injury for me, uh, you know, a younger athlete is kind of ACL tear, so I've proved myself otherwise. Um, whether that's based on the history or your exam. Um, you know, other things that you know, kind of pretty high on your list most of the time are going to be like some kind of patellar instability, patellar dislocation, subluxation, some type of meniscal injury, and then uh, collateral ligament injury is also common. Uh, fractures certainly can happen. Uh, I did have one kid on the sideline once that had a kind of, uh, it was traumatic, so he got hit, but his knee kind of got twisted. Uh, exam on sidelines, like, yeah, you tore, you tore your ACL. Came to the office like that next Monday. Uh, and he actually had like a medial femoral condyle injury that is uh, that, that you know was shifting as I was doing a Lockman exam on him, and that's why it felt like an ACL. So uh, you can get fooled occasionally, so it's still probably wise to get X-rays even in those situations where you're pretty confident what you what you got going on. So a lot of these things you know get pretty rapid swelling within the knee. Um, you know, most within eight hours, you know, things like a fracture or an ACL tear, they can swell within an hour um, because there's a kind of acute bleeding into the knee. Uh, they'll typically show up as loss of motion, mostly because of that swelling that's there. And then um, they'll have tenderness somewhere on the knee. Sometimes this hurts everywhere. And that makes it really challenging for you to narrow down your differential. Uh, hopefully, you know, the pain will localize somewhere. Uh, and that in combination with the mechanism of injury uh, can be super helpful in trying to narrow down what you think is going on. So key things to get, and this is oftentimes, you know, you're not going to get this from your staff. You know, they're going to come in and say, I twisted my knee, and that's what you're going to get. So uh, ask the athlete or patient to describe what happened to your, you know, which direction did your knee go. If they can't give it to you, then I, a lot of times will show them, did your knee buckle this way, buckle this way? Um, did you feel like it went backwards? So try to ask specific questions because this is all biomechanics, and if you know which way the knee went, then you can kind of just picture in your mind what structures are going to get injured, what things were compressed, what things are stretched. So good question. Always ask if they, you know, felt or heard a pop in their knee with the twisting. Uh, somebody that feels that or hears that raises ACL tear a little higher on my list for sure, but they don't always feel it. And then the onset of swelling. Again, rapid onset of swelling, fracture, ACL, kind of bump up higher. Um, I would say patellar dislocation can also swell relatively quickly. But like meniscal injury or collateral ligament injury, they usually don't swell quite as quite as fast. They, they may say, well, I woke up the next day and it was swollen, or hours later it was swollen. And then a good question for an athlete too, were you able to continue playing? So, you know, an athlete that tears their ACL uh, has a significant ligament injury like MCL, LCL, that's you know, where the ligaments partially or completely torn. Pretty rare for them to continue playing. I've seen athletes play on a meniscal tear, you know, they keep going, or mild sprains, I've seen them keep playing. But it's just a little unusual. So I've had a couple people that have played on an ACL, surprisingly. Um, but if they can't, again, raises your concern about something more significant happening. Um, mechanical symptoms, you know, things that you're going to see with, you know, typically meniscal injury. And then always ask about, you know, stability. Does the knee feel stable underneath you? Does it feel like it's giving way? Does it feel unstable? You know, again, those kind of things kind of raise the possibility of ACL or other ligament injury. And then if they've had any previous knee problems or surgeries, it's always good, good to know.
So when you're going into your knee exam, you know, always be systematic about it. Start out with looking at the knee, then move your way through range of motion. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you can kind of have the athlete or patient do that themselves rather than you trying to move it. That builds trust. You can just have them move it as much as they're willing to do. Uh, then you get into kind of pushing on it, doing a strength test or strength and special test. So uh, if you can, um, sorry, wa watch somebody walk in. So sometimes you've missed it. You've been in another room and you haven't seen them walk and they're already on a table or sitting down. Uh, so that may not be the first thing that you do uh, is to watch, you know, have them get up and walk on it. But at some point in your exam, maybe when you're done or before you get, you know, have them lay down, you know, have them take a few steps if they can and see how they're walking around or if they can bear any weight at all. Uh, if they just won't or can't bear weight, then I think you're probably going to need to get an x-ray because uh, that would kind of throw in the Ottawa knee rules. If they can't weight bear in your office, then you're probably going to need to get a radiograph. So uh, try to observe how they walk. Most people with a painful, swollen knee will kind of keep it partially bent, but typically be able to bear some weight on it if, it's, you know, if they don't have a fracture. So swelling, uh, again, kind of key things to pay attention to. Uh, and trying to sort out, is this swelling that they have intra-articular or is it extra-articular swelling? You know, extra-articular swelling will be kind of more localized. You'll feel it more superficially. Uh, as far as intra-articular swelling or an effusion, most of the time it's going to collect in that supra-patellar area. And it can be underestimated if you're just examining a patient in a seat, seated position, like in a wheelchair or something like that. You really got to get them laying down flat on a table with the knee out straight uh, to be able to assess whether they have an effusion. If you have ultrasound available, it's a great tool to throw on there and take a look. You can see whether you know there's any hypoechoic signal in the suprapatellar pouch or if it's, if it's prepatellar or somewhere else. So ultrasound is a nice tool if you know patient body habitus or other factors, and it can still kind of hard to tell, you know, where where the swelling in the knee is. So after you've done that, you know, move on to range of motion. Um, this is showing you in a seated position, but kind of average range of motion for the knee is going to be from about 130 degrees of flexion out to full extension, which is what we consider zero. So um, if somebody is short of, you know, can't fully extend, then you're gonna say their motion was from, you know, five to 120, or if it's, you know, they can't, they're 10 degrees short, then it's 10 to 10 to 120. So that's kind of how you would document that, that range of motion. There are many people that can hyperextend. So if they, if you can passively hyperextend their knee and you call them like a minus five or minus 10 to whatever amount of flexion that, that you have as far as your documentation is concerned. So then you just move on to palpation. And again, I, I, I tend to be pretty systematic about this. I usually start up around the kneecap, palpate around the kneecap itself, move the kneecap around. You can, you know, you can check a patellar apprehension test and then kind of down the, you know, along the quad tendon and the patellar tendon. And then from there, I move to the joint lines and along the collateral ligaments um, to try and assess kind of where, you know, where they tend to hurt. And again, kind of just be systematic in palpating structures that are you know, most commonly injured. And again, it's really important just to know your surface anatomy when you're, when you're going about that. So uh, patellar apprehension test is pictured here um, where you basically are pushing on the medial side of the kneecap and trying to glide it laterally. Most patellar dislocations are going to occur, are going to dislocate laterally. Uh, and the, the positive test is, is one where not only it causes pain, but also kind of this fear that the patella is going to dislocate again or slip out of place. Sometimes you can't push somebody that far. Um, to get to that point, but you know, or they will volunteer that that that's what they feel. But I always ask, okay, does that just hurt, or do you, do you feel like the knee, kneecap might slip out of place again? Um, and so that's this should good question to ask while you're doing that test. Then you move on to checking the collateral ligaments, um, and this is really the a good position to do this in. Uh, I see a lot of people will kind of try and lift the whole leg up and get it off the table and you know maneuver it that way. Um, if you can just have the patient relaxed and kind of move them towards the edge of the table, let their thigh rest on the table, and then have the knee kind of, you know, over the edge. And then you can use your hip or your hand as a kind of a fulcrum to test the, uh, the medial collateral ligament with valgus stress. So on the, you know, this picture on the left, he's kind of using his body and then, you know, kind of pushing the knee outward to stress the MCL. You want to do that in 30 degrees of, you know, flexion and also they, you know, people do it in full extension. Um, I sometimes do it in full, full extension. Most of the time, I just start at 30 degrees. If it's pretty solid at that position, I don't need you know, really not much reason to check full extension. If you're getting some laxity at 30 or you think, man, this might be a complete tear, try it at full extension. If you're still feeling a lot of looseness there, then that tells you, well, this is a pretty, you know, it's a grade two or grade three injury to the MCL. And with all of these ligamentous you know, tests, you really need to check the other side too. 
because people can have some uh, kind of baseline laxity to their ligaments. And so it might feel a little loose to you. And you're like, well, I don't know, is that loose? You know, you have to check the other side to know if that's really loose for that patient. So varus stress is going to be just the opposite. So kind of same position. All this, this picture probably shows the guy kind of having the leg off the table. But you want your hand on the medial side, uh, other hand on the malleolus, and then trying to push the knee into more of a varus position, stressing the lateral collateral ligament. Uh, oh, I will say this. If you get like what you think is kind of an isolated lateral collateral ligament injury, if it's just pain and not loose, I've seen those. If you feel like that lateral collateral ligament's really loose, then you know, compared to the other side, always be suspicious for another ligament injury, specifically the ACL. So if you think somebody's like completely torn the lateral collateral ligament, most of the time the ACL is going to go too. And if you haven't, you know, if you haven't picked that up on your own exam, at least think, well, maybe I can't just can't feel it and at least go looking for it. So just a just something that has happened in my own experience. So from there, um, you, know, you can do the Lachman exam. You know, if you're really highly suspicious for an ACL tear, you might do this test first before you go to the collaterals because it might bother them. And uh, if once they're if they're starting to guard because you're doing things to their knee and they're going to start tightening up on you, you at least want to get this test, you know, a good one before like before you get into that situation. But Lachman exam, you know, best position is to have the patient again supine. You want to flex the knee about 30 degrees. And, you know, have one knee kind of under the on the back side of the thigh with your thumb wrapping over the top, and then your other hand down on the tibia. And you really just want to be shifting the tibia forward. It's 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 just a straightforward, almost up towards your nose as you're kind of over the uh, over the top looking at the knee. Um, you really have to get the patient to relax well. Uh, and if your hands back there on the hamstrings, you can feel that. You can feel if they're tightening up their hamstrings, with it and just have to kind of kind of roll the knee around, say try and relax your leg. You know, gain some trust with them. And once you can feel the hamstrings relax, that's when you, that's when you want to start to pull forward. Because if their hamstrings are tightened up, you're not you're just not going to get a good test. Uh, and you'll think it's fine when it's when it may not be. So the other test you can do is anterior drawer, um, and that's with the knee kind of bent at 90 degrees. Uh, that's the hand, proper hand position for it. You got your hands kind of right on the front of the tibia, thumbs on the uh, right on the joint line. And you're trying to shift the shift the tibia forward. Um, I don't like this test as well, but it's a good alternative. You just don't feel like you're getting a good Lachman exam. Um, again, you want to test side to side. The problem is you're kind of always pulling against the pull of the hamstrings, and I think it's just less it's less sensitive and specific compared to Lachman exam, but is an option. Um, pivot shift test is a little bit more complicated. I'll, I'll just mention it. Honestly, I really rarely do a pivot shift on anybody, and I, I would not recommend doing it on acutely injured knee. Uh, it's hard to do, and they're not going to like you for it. It's more a test that I think is uh, positive in the subacute um, phase of, of the injury or something that's had a chronic ACL tear. So it's a test that's mentioned in, um, and you can look up how to do it. So you have to really have to see the video to, to ever somebody, have somebody demonstrate it. This still picture doesn't do it justice. Uh, but it's a, as you kind of bring the knee out in the valgus and then push forward, it's kind of rotate, you'll feel the tibia kind of rotate back into place as you're kind of, you know, flexing the knee and extending it. Just feel that kind of rotational movement of the tibia. Um, it's not a fun test to put somebody through that's really hurting. So what I usually do is I'll go, you know, if I've done an anterior drawer, then I'll do a posterior drawer from there, which is essentially just trying to push the tibia the opposite direction. Uh, you're wanting to test the PCL uh, with that test. Um, and the, the thing you want to do is have your kind of IP joints on the, on the tibia and then your, the pads of your thumb should be kind of on the femoral condyles. And then as you shove forward, you can feel how much that kind of pushes, you know, straightens up, it kind of pushes your thumbs into more of a straightened position because they should be flexed when they're in a normal position. And, and you can, again, kind of compare that side to side and feeling the tibia really shift a lot posteriorly, uh, then you'd be suspicious for a PCL tear. Um, typical mechanism for a PCL tear is not even anything close to an ACL. It's more of a kind of direct blow landing on a flex knee, at least in athletics. That's the most common mechanism you're going to see that type of injury where the tibia gets shoved backwards and tears the PCL. The other thing you see with a PCL tear, um, again, not well pictured with this, is a, it's called a tibial sag sign, um, where the, you kind of see this thing scooped out. Uh, hard for me to point out to everybody here, but you know, kind of scooped out here where the tibial tuberosity would be, where it's kind of pushing forward on the other. You can kind of elevate both knees up in a, in a bent position and just look across there uh, at 90 degrees to be able to see if the tibia sags backwards. You know, if you see that, then be suspicious for a PCL. 
quadriceps active test is a test again more for a chronic PCL tear, but uh, what will happen is as, as the tibia is, in, in the bent, is bent, the tibia will be subluxed posteriorly. When we contract the quadriceps, you'll see it shift to the, shift back anteriorly into a normal position. Um, so that, that's what the quadriceps active test. Again, some not necessary for an acute injury, but somebody that maybe had an injury in the past, not getting better, they come in, um, you might pick up, pick up on that with that, uh, with that test. Dial test, I'll skip. So McMurray's test, um, these are their meniscal testing. So the, what you're trying to accomplish is trying to pinch the meniscus between the femoral condyle and the, prox and the, and the tibial plateau. So if you think about mechanically what you're doing, you're going to bend the knee. And if you put a valgus force, then you're going to compress the lateral side of the knee. And you also want to kind of rotate, you know, point the, yeah, point the heel in that direction too, as you're doing that to kind of rotate the tibia, you know, to, to pinch the meniscus. And then you're kind of straightening it back out. So basically trying to catch, you know, the meniscus between those two bones, whichever side you're testing, you know, for lateral uh, is, is, or for medial meniscus is the kind of the top picture here and the lateral meniscus is the bottom picture. So your lateral meniscus are doing more of a valgus stress, medial meniscus are doing more of a varus stress to pinch the meniscus between the two bones as you, as you kind of rotate and straighten. So does that make sense? So, you know, x-ray things that you can see, um, you know, obviously you can pick up a, uh, you can pick up a fracture. Uh, sometimes with ACLs, they can actually, instead of tearing the ligament, you'll get a, you'll get a fracture right at the tibial eminence where it's attached. Uh, so I have seen those on occasion. Um, again, this picture on the, on the patella is actually, is obviously a patellar subluxation or dislocation where the patella is out of place. Usually that's pretty obvious clinically um, and not something that's gonna probably walk into your office most of the time. It's gonna go to the emergency room to get that type of picture. Uh, typically, by the time they get to you, that's been reduced or reduced on its own. Uh, there is a, have you guys ever heard of a Sagan fracture? Have you ever heard of that? I mentioned it in a couple other talks, I think, or at least one other one. Uh, Sagan fracture is actually a little uh, fleck, kind of avulsion fracture. It's all you can see off the lateral joint line uh, on the knee, and it's pathognomonic for an ACL tear. So if you ever get a board question that shows that little fracture, it's, it's typically a relatively small fragment you know, a centimeter or less sitting over there near the lateral joint line, uh, the answer is probably that they torn the ACL. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, fracture of Sagan or Sagan fracture. So what are you going to do with most of these athletes? So there are certainly times, and you guys probably had these, where you, an athlete comes in or a patient comes in, they twisted their knee, you're trying to get a good exam on them, you just can't. I was like, I don't know, I can't really quite tell which person <laughs> they hurt everywhere. I can't get a good, you know, can't get, get good tests on things. Um, what do you do? Well, you know, you can certainly go straight to an MRI, which gets expensive and most insurance companies are not going to allow that these days anyway. You know, there are still some private insurance that you might be able to, but you know, what's most reasonable probably is just, well, let's treat things symptomatically and then, you know, bring them back and reevaluate it. So they can't wait bear, get them on some crutches. Um, I usually have them start working on their motion right away. There are two, situ well, I guess three situations where put people in a knee immobilizer. So if, I'm, if I think they have a fracture, then I'll do it. If, you know, if you think they had some type of patellar instability, like they dislocated their kneecap the first time or it slipped out, then that, then I put them in a knee immobilizer, keep it straight. Or if the position of extension is just the most comfortable position the patient has. There are sometimes people come in and like, it, I can't bend it. It just feels best to keep it straight. Then I'll use it sometimes just manage symptoms. But other than that, really don't use a knee immobilizer. I mean, if you're moonlighting or those kinds of things, I mean, unless you just, again, if you're just concerned, I think there's something broken, I just don't know, then do it. But if, you, if you're pretty confident this is more soft tissue injury, you know, then it's probably more, it's really more important, I think, to give somebody, uh, you know, get the knee moving uh, rather than making them stiff by having a knee immobilizer. Uh, have them ice the knee, take NSAIDs, uh, and then usually bring them back, reevaluate in, you know, a week or two. And typically once the knee's settled down a little bit, you're going to get a better exam and be able to figure out what's going on. So I think, you know, I would agree like 80, 90% of the time on that second visit, you're going to be at least have a pretty good idea what's going on uh, with that knee. If you just can't, it's been two visits, like I still can't get a good exam, I'm still not sure. Then I think you at least have something to lean on as far as like, you know, getting an MRI uh, or if you have to have some kind of peer to peer conversation with somebody that's questioning why you're getting an MRI, at least have some, something to stand on for that. So we'll go through some specific injuries. Uh, any questions on exam or just 
everybody's pretty good, feel pretty confident with their knee exam. So you're mostly nodding heads here at least. All right, so uh, ACL injuries, what are you gonna usually see? Again, they're gonna be usually able to weight bear. A lot of times with a slightly bent knee, they typically have an effusion. That's not, you know, nothing's all the time in medicine, but most people with an ACL tear have an effusion. They're gonna have positive Lachman and pivot shift if you do it. Um, you know, any kind of a vascular injury is pretty rare, but you know, with any exam, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you check your different pulses. So uh, diagnosis, I think you can, you know, when you're good with your exam, you can make an, the diagnosis of an ACL tear just based on your, on your history and physical. You know, I, I tell most people when I tell them that it's torn, you know, I'm 90% sure it's torn. Um, I've for sure been wrong. You know, I've had people that I was convinced that an ACL tear and the MRI proves otherwise uh, and vice versa. So it, you know, nobody's perfect, but uh, I think in general, you can, you know, if you do enough of these, you're going to be pretty good to make the diagnosis. You know, in those questionable cases or just feel slightly loose, but not completely torn uh, or I'm suspicious or I just can't get an exam and MRI is really the gold standard to try and make the diagnosis. Uh, this is a picture here of what an ACL usually looks like. Um, the arrow, red arrows are pointing to kind of where the ACL should be attaching. You can see the proximal part of the ACL kind of laying there, almost like in a, you know, kind of more of a horizontal position rather than kind of a 45 degree, uh, 45 to 60 degree um, track up there in the back side of the, or in the notch there on the, uh, on the lateral sagittal cuts. So what do you do with ACL injury? Well, in athletes, the, the answer is surgery. Uh, it's a reconstruction. Um, bone, patellar tendon bone is still kind of the gold standard for fixing ACLs. There are lots of other grafts choices that you can use depending on the athlete and the surgeon, hamstring, quadriceps, there's allografts that can be used. Uh, it's an outpatient surgery, typically uh, kept protecting the mobilizer for the first couple weeks. And then after that, um, they get them, get them moving more aggressively and get them into physical therapy. Uh, the immobilizers mainly for running up and about, but most people get put in a, what's called a continuous, pass, continuous passive motion right off the bat where they're, you know, it's a machine that kind of moves the knee for them, typically up to about 40 to 60 degrees early on that they gradually progress from. Uh, it's a long rehab and return to play. I mean, really, somebody getting back to sports typically six months uh, at the earliest. Uh, most people, it's probably closer to nine months. Um, and they're, I, in my opinion, watching most people come back from the ACL, they're not the same player until probably two years later. You know, not the first season back, but the second season back. So it is definitely a long recovery. Um, quick mention on allografts. I don't think that's a good choice in most athletes. An allograft uh, is a cadaver graft. So it acts like a scaffold, which basically has to be recellularized and become a live graft again. That process is a, takes a while, like a year, and uh, re, re rates pretty high. So if you have a high level um, athlete or you know high demand athlete or a high demand job, um, you know allograft is probably not your best choice. But some low demand uh, person that just needs a stabilized knee, you know, is a reasonable choice for somebody. So just some quick stuff on rehab, but uh, aerobic exercise, they can already start walking or biking pretty early. Uh, four to six weeks, they start doing some leg press, Stairmaster, and then uh, by six to eight weeks, they're really doing more kind of functional things um, and some power exercises. So again, average term to play is four to six months. And like I mentioned, especially elite levels, a couple of years to look normal again. Questions on ACLs? Yeah. Does the, the choice of like graph the I would, yeah, I would say both. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes the surgeon feels like one in their hands, they do better with one type of graft compared to another. Oh, question for those was uh, choice of graft, is that based on the athlete or the surgeon? And my answer is kind of both. Um, so sometimes that depends on the sport played. People that have bone, like patellar tendon graft, they do have, I mean, studies show they do have more patellofemoral issues. So if you're you know, jumping sport or sport that really stresses that doing a lot, you may choose a hamstring graft or you know, a, as an alternative just to avoid that potential complication. Um, so you know, I've seen some soccer players and basketball players choose hamstring over bone patellar tendon because of that. But it, it's kind of, it's, the answer is both. You know, what the surgeon is comfortable doing and then what, what's right for that athlete based on their sport. Because there's ups and downs to any kind of graft choice. No, nothing's perfect. Other question? Yeah. Right. 
Yes. Um, question was, do surgeons always want the MRI? I would say in general, yes. They, they do usually want an MRI. Uh, and it, some of that's to assess for other internal derangement and surgical planning. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question wherever you end up practicing, you know, whatever orthopedists are around, you can ask them what their preferences are. But in general, yes, they certainly usually does want an MRI. What's yeah. the timeline on getting a surgeon? Like, do you usually have to do a couple weeks down the road and yeah, so the question is, what's the timeline to see the surgeon? Um, really, I mean, most surgeons are not going to do, do this surgery acutely, so they're going to delay it typically two to four weeks uh, after the injury. The goals of that time are to get the effusion down, get your range of motion back, try and get your quadricep strength back before surgery. So, um, you know, it depends how busy your surgeon is. I would say if you're pretty confident in the diagnosis and you're ordering an MRI, it's probably fine to go ahead and set up that appointment um, for them to talk because then they can, the surgeon can kind of schedule it at the time that works for best for both the patient and him, you know, him or her that's doing the, doing the surgery, you know, based on their schedule. So, uh, I mean, honestly, it can be delayed months and the fix is the same. So um, what I usually do is I, I order the MRI and at least wait for the results to make sure it truly is torn. Because like I said, I, sometimes I'm wrong. And then, you know, once I get that result, if it confirms what I think is going on, then we set up the appointment. So that's kind of how I usually do. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. All right. So other questions? Patellar dislocation. Uh, typically with peripatellar tendinous, they uh, don't want to bend the knee much. They, they usually have a quite a large effusion. So it almost looks like a fracture. Uh, and most of the time with patellar dislocation, they even swell more than ACL pairs that I've seen. Uh, they, get a, they get quite a bit of swelling in the joint. Um, most people are going to tell you. I mean, I've, I've certainly had a few over the years that just can't mention it at all. You know, you don't get an MRI because you don't know, can't figure out what's going on. They have a pattern consistent with patellar dislocation and the athlete or patient gives you nothing of that story. But most people will say, yeah, my kneecap, I saw my kneecap pop off the side or I felt it slip out of place. Uh, you know, and then it, then it popped back in. Um, so most people will volunteer that. On physical exam, again, positive apprehension time, sign. Uh, they tend to have a stiff leg gait. So those are people that tend to want to keep the knee fully straight. They don't want to bend it at all. Um, they, they don't, and they have an effusion, again, tenderness around the kneecap on exam. So diagnosis, again, usually physical and hi history and physical uh, are enough. Um, you get x-rays. When you do that, make sure you get a, what's called an infrapatellar view or sunrise view. Because uh, I can pick up an avulsion injury off the patella or a shearing injury uh, off the uh, typically the lateral femoral uh, or lateral trochlea as the kneecap shifts you know shifts outwards. Sometimes the point of the patella, that back part, will kind of shear off, or you'll get a shearing uh, fracture of the uh, of the trochlea. So those those are two things. If it's a big chunk that might change somebody's management, um, usually small little injuries there don't change your management much at all. Um, MRIs, again, not usually needed for most patellar dislocations. Uh, again, diagnosis that's questionable, you might end up getting it. So what do you do for treatment? Uh, I typically put, this is one instance where I put people in an immobilizer. I usually have them in it for at least the first couple of weeks, sometimes up to four weeks, uh, depending how they're doing. Uh, but usually around two to three weeks, I'm switching them out of the immobilizer into like a patellar stabilizer brace. It is fine to bear weight in the immobilizer. You don't have to keep their weight off. Um, and then it's you know, usually around six to eight weeks is when you're going to get them started on physical therapy, doing some strengthening things, uh, you know, aerobic and anaerobic in, uh, exercising, you know, functional functional uh, strengthening, and then uh, BMO strengthening. So the BMO exercise is something you can have somebody do right off the bat because they can do it in, with, this, with the immobilizer on, uh, kind of bending the knee upward, having the kind of toe up and rotated out just a little bit. And it's just a straight leg raise, basically, by kind of focusing more on the medial uh, quadriceps. So what do you do for treatment? Well, um, you can offer somebody surgery after a first time patellar dislocation because in a young athlete, it's fairly likely it's gonna happen again. Um, some people choose to not go that route because they don't want surgery. And so they can treat things with you know, physical therapy and hope for the best that it doesn't recur. Uh, but, but those that have, continue to have recurrent patellar instability, it's a medial patella, uh, patellar ligament repair. Uh, in really bad cases, or 
where somebody has kind of miserable malalignment, so they have kind of valgus knees uh, and the, maybe just the ligament, sometimes the medial patellofemoral ligament repair alone hasn't done the trick. Uh, they'll do um, advancement of the VMO um, or what's called a proximal distal realignment. So they'll try to basically decrease that Q angle, the angle from measured from the ASIS down to the top of the kneecap and then from the kneecap to the tibial tuberosity. They'll essentially shift the tuberosity immediately and make that more of a straight line to keep the, the kneecap from going to track in the lateral position. So you'll see people sometimes that have had that surgery for, for current dislocations. Questions on patellar dislocation? And kind of similar, like since the last one. Um, so if you're an athlete, you're, you have a dislocation, you want surgery, are you going to need an MRI prior to that surgery then as well? Okay, yeah. So the question was, uh, an athlete that's considering surgery after patella dislocation, do they need an MRI? Um, hmm, I, I, that's one I was a little bit, maybe, maybe not. I would talk to, to again, probably surgeon preference, whoever you typically send those people to, uh, find out what they want. And if they want it, then get it. Um, if they say it's not necessary, then I don't think you have to. So. And can you still, can you offer patients who are athletes still one time Surgery or sure. Okay. Yeah. No. So the other question is, can you offer patients that are that aren't athletes after the first time dislocation surgery? And the answer is certainly yes. You know, I was just had I was just discuss risk. You know, it's like this has happened once. It'll scar down, but it's you know depending how active you are, you know, there's a reasonable, pretty reasonable chance it's going to happen again. It's not fun, you know, to happen again, but most of the time, the second time around, it's not nearly as bad because the soft tissue injuries. Not as severe. It's already happened once, kind of like you know, a recurrent ankle sprain. First time's bad, and the second time you feel like you tweak it. Um, so it's just a choice. I give the patient a choice, and then you know, they can choose what they want to do. Other questions? Okay. Meniscal tear. Uh, what makes you suspicious for those things? This is a picture of the kind of different types that you can see. You know, radial tears, transverse tears, uh, bucket handle tears. But usually the symptoms they're going to present with are joint line tenderness and kind of catching, locking, typically swelling with activity, um, and oftentimes pain when the knee's a little bit flexed or pivoting on it. You know, the activities that's going to bother them the most um, on their history on exam. May or may not have an effusion. Usually, if they have an effusion, it's not tense. You know, you'll see some swelling in the joint, but it's not usually severe. Um, typically, have joint line tenderness. Uh, oftentimes, they fully. They have pain, pain in kind of the end range of motion, so full extension. Or when you really flex it back, they'll feel that again. Kind of depends on the location on that, on that C-shaped meniscus where the tear is. So, uh, as far as what bothers them the most, um, you know, a clunk sign is kind of like what you kind of gym, doing a McMurray's test. You feel like something kind of, you know, kind of moving or shifting within the knee, and oftentimes they'll they'll walk with a slightly bent knee as well. So, how do you figure out whether they got a, a you know, meniscal tear? You got to get an MRI. It's not going to show up on on an X-ray, and really, you know. I, Physical exam's okay for meniscal tears, but there's so many other things, you know, like bone bruising can act like a meniscal tear, arthritis can act like a meniscal tear. Um, so especially the older patients you get, it gets a lot, of, it's a lot tougher diagnosis to get just based off your exam. Uh, and so MRI is what you gotta do. Uh, this is a pretty good picture of what one looks like. So that kind of white line in the middle of that dark triangle that's the that's the meniscus there. Usually you wanna see that if you're looking at your own MRIs, you wanna see that on two consecutive cuts to kind of make sure to Kind of nail down that that's truly something there because sometimes you can sit, get degenerative signal in an older patient that will look kind of similar in within the meniscus itself uh, it can fool you so i have there are some times where you still think that meniscus tear even though the mri is like questionable or the radiologist doesn't give me a definitive read uh, so in those instances you can always punt to the surgeon and let them discuss whether they want to do a diagnostic scope uh, which certainly is still sometimes done so what do you do for meniscal tears? Well, unfortunately, conservative treatment usually doesn't work. Um, most of these happen in the zone of, uh, of the meniscus called the white zone, which is just doesn't have very good vascularity, so they just don't heal very well. Um, tears in the outer third have a good blood supply and sometimes can heal. So you know, it's not gonna say all of them don't heal, but it's just not many of them do because unfortunately most of them occur in the area that doesn't have good blood supply. So if you get these peripheral tears, you know, sometimes they can get, uh, they can actually heal over time. But most of the treatment is going to be arthroscopy. Um, it's, it's a again quick outpatient procedure. Uh, if they just do a resection of the tear, uh, which is certainly done more um, probably 10 years ago than these days, um, 
then they can get back to support sometimes within a couple of weeks. I mean, they just kind of trim out that torn piece and then you can see we did back, back up playing relatively quickly. Um, if they repair it, I uh, put six to eight weeks there, but I've seen that take sometimes 12 weeks where they're out a good three months. Again, depends on the surgeon. And really these days they're doing a lot more kind of, uh, a lot more procedures to try and uh, save the meniscus and not resect it. And that's because a lot, you know, based on experience, they see that the more meniscus you take out down the road, you know, people tend to have more arthritis in that compartment. Um, so it's better, you know, even though it seems like, well, ah, you don't really need that thing, right? Well, <laughs> put there for a reason. <laughs> Your knee probably does really need it. So any other questions on meniscus? All right. What are your timeline on getting an MRI? Timeline on an MRI for a meniscus tear? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so yeah, the question is, how long do you wait to get an MRI on some of your suspicions of a meniscus tear? I would say in, I mean, it really depends on, so we'll talk about athletes and non-athletes. So an athlete depends like what level athlete, are they in season? Do they, do they just need an answer from a standpoint of continued participation? Is it safe? Is it not safe? You know, those kinds of questions. So I think in season athlete, um, I'm probably a little more aggressive. I'll maybe wait a couple weeks and see if they get better. And if they, you know, they were two to four weeks and then if they're not, I'll get it. Um, there are times I get it right off the bat just because they got to know, you know, especially a collegiate athlete, um, I'll get it right away. Um, an athlete out of season, yeah, probably I'm waiting more a month to six weeks because, you know, bone bruising can kind of act the same way and some of the mechanism can be quite similar. And if they don't really have mechanical symptoms, it's just joint line pain, I'll, I'll wait uh, or at least encourage them to wait. Now, some people push and, and, you know, they really want it. You know, that's, that's the challenge of things sometimes. Um, Older people that have maybe have more likely to have arthritis and other things, I'll drag my feet at least a good six weeks from most of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, it's like it's okay to wait. You know, it's the missing meniscal tear in most instances, the fix is the same. So if you found it now or found it six weeks from now or found it two months from now, it's the same fix. Now, the downside of waiting potentially, say it's a younger person that's really active and they think, well, doc didn't think my meniscus is torn and they try to keep playing on it. And the downside of not knowing that diagnosis is they could extend their tear or, you know, if the meniscus is flipped or in some weird position, then you start to get some, you know, odd kind of chondral, in, you know, wear and tear in the joint, which could, you know, potentially affect them down the road. So there's that, you know, potential risk in waiting and somebody that's pretty active or you, know, you think might push it. But for the most part, there's no, you know, the time, there's no, from a standpoint of definitive treatment, it's, it's fine to find it late, you know, um, but it's definitely individualized. When I've been over there, I've got to do it in the past, I feel like there were um, situations where you decided, like, our process would be, like, a really bad idea. I'm trying to remember if it's in patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, there's situations over in the clinic when he's been, somebody's been over in clinic with me uh, where arthroscopy was not the right thing for a meniscal tear. And those situations are basically uh, people with underlying OA that have a degenerative tear. So a tear that occurs from kind of normal wear and tear uh, or something pretty minimal. Uh, and you get an x-ray, it also shows like some moderate arthritis in the same point. So there's there's great evidence. It's a JAMA article. I can't remember how long it was published. Looked at thousands of patients with degenerative tears who had arthroscopy, and we know they do worse. So degenerative meniscal tears is a different animal, um, and arthroscopy is not the treatment. You, know, you have to treat their underlying arthritic problem because it's a it's just an unfortunate consequence of the degenerative process that's happening within within that patient's knee. So I think that, yeah, that's what you're thinking of. All right, so collateral ligament injury, um, usually a varus or valgus type mechanism, um, can be a you know kind of indirect kind of twisting with no trauma, or it can be a direct blow. They usually have some you know some swelling, pain, uh, may feel some instability in the knee. Um, uh, again, positive stress tests on exam, and then you grade that laxity one to three. So one is just 
pain, the stress, it doesn't really feel loose. Two is looseness with an endpoint. Grade three injury is feels like there's really no endpoint to it. Uh, and you can you know, get a sense of that again, uh, checking side to side. So treatment for a collateral ligament injury is non-operative. Um, so range of motion, ice, they can weight bear. You might put them in a brace for some stability and support. Uh, as far as like returning to play, a grade one injury, a lot of times people can be back in a couple weeks. Uh, grade two is usually more on the two to four, sometimes up to six week range. And then a grade three injury definitely is at least six weeks in my experience as far as getting back to play. Uh, if you have like a multi-ligament, so say completely torn MCL, completely torn, torn ACL, and maybe a posterior lateral corner injury, some surgeons will fix the MCL injury, but not, you know, in general, uh, collateral ligament injuries do not require surgery. So again, that mention of if you have an isolated two, grade two to three injury of the lateral collateral ligament, you know, at least be suspicious that there could be an ACL tear as well. So diagnosis, usually x-rays are normal. Uh, you do them to do it to rule out other things. Uh, you know, keep, it, keep in mind your auto knee rules. If somebody just won't bear weight, then you probably should get it. But I think exam alone is usually good enough for most collateral ligament injuries and MRIs rarely needed, at least uh, early on. Um, there is, you know, medial collateral ligament, there is some attachment of the deep fibers of that ligament to the MCL, I'm sorry, to the medial meniscus. So if you have an MCL injury, you're pretty confident of it. You're following them along. It's been a reasonable length of time. You think this should be getting better and they're still having some symptoms there that aren't improving, you know, then kind of delayed, I will get an MRI to make sure they don't have an associated meniscal tear. So it's just not as MCL injuries that aren't getting better. So questions about that? Collateral and ligament injury are fairly straightforward. All right, so in conclusion, you know, twisting injury, especially an athlete, kind of keep ACL pretty high on your list uh, on your differential. Um, make sure you get a good history and uh, mechanism is extremely important when you're uh, evaluating people that come in with these complaints. Be systematic with your physical exam, practice while you're here, you know, get, hopefully get some ex plenty of experience when they're coming over uh, into our office. Um, for most people, early motion rehab is going to be your initial treatment with all these things. And then you can, you know, sort things out delayed if you need to. Uh, nine times out of 10, you're going to get, you know, the diagnosis based on your history and physical exam and your x-rays, but certainly uh, uh, get an MRI when you need to use it ju judiciously. Um, and then return to play is really dependent for me on most of these things. Once they have full range of motion, no effusion, uh, good strength, and they can pass functional testing. So. Functional testing, you can print some of these things out. There's mm -hmm. functional progression for field and court sports uh, that are available online. You can print some of those up and give them to the athlete. Uh, if they have an athletic trainer available, that really helps because you know, it's somebody at their school that can help run somebody through that, but a parent or coach can, can put somebody through that list. So I, you know, I try to, especially with athletes, they always want to know, when can I go back? So I try to put a set time frame. I give them averages, but I say, hey, for you, it's going to come down to this. You know. Your motion's back, your strength's good, and you can do what you have to do on the field, then you're ready to go. So uh, that way you're not giving some, you know, two weeks and be hard line. Questions? Oh, we answered a lot on the way. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. See you in a couple weeks.